Hi, I'm Jim Pazinski. Welcome to Microsoft and welcome to the Teacher Education Initiative, or TEI. In this video, Mark Hoffler, Associate Professor of Education at the College of William & Mary, discusses the importance of TPAC and how it is used as the underlying foundation for TEI. I too am in the video and I discuss what TEI is and why we developed it in the way that we did. Also covered at the end of the video is a review of the assets available through TEI. As always, I encourage you to share these resources with your colleagues and join in on the TEI initiative. Thank you. This particular session right now is around TPAC, and my colleague Mark Hoffer at the College of Women Mary will be coming up and talking about TPAC. And what I want to do is to, to set the stage right now and, and why we're, we're doing this initiative and why TPAC is involved in this particular initiative. So it's, it's interesting that we're back here again because, again, as Mike said about a year ago, I was at NTLS, and it's really the genesis of this whole initiative. Uh, we have had, for a number of years, uh, what Lawrence said, Partners in Learning, and it's been heretofore mostly focused on K-12 education. And so when we decided to advance it into higher education, um, instead of the usual Microsoft way of just kind of putting the program together, we thought we'd get the advice of academics. And so Glenn and Mike and David and others were kind enough to invite me to NPLS last year, and I learned a tremendous amount. And um, one of the things we learned was around TPAC. And so we decided to make that the foundation of this workshop. Now, to be very explicit, to be very clear, what T TEI, the Teacher Education Initiative is, it's really about helping faculty members in schools of education better utilize technology. So as a consequence of that, their students, who will eventually be teachers, go out and more appropriately utilize technology. Now, the caveat to that is, is that there's not an assumption that they don't use technology today or they don't appropriately use technology today. But I think that the evidence is in this room by you all being here that there is a, a, uh, an inquiry, a search going on for how can we more appropriately use it, how can we better utilize it. And so that's what the TI is about. How can we better and appropriately utilize technology in our classrooms today? So uh, when we talk about uh, why we're focused on schools of education, there's probably two major reasons why that's the case. The first is, as Lauren mentioned, a lot of it has to do with our pedigree, where we can come from. We have been heretofore involved in K-12 education for probably about a decade now, and have worked with many teachers around the world, uh, trained them on the utilization of technology. So it really was a, a kind of an easy leap for us to start in this particular area with regard to schools of education as opposed to business schools or med schools, et cetera. But perhaps more important to that, was in talking with many of your faculty colleagues as well as um, in looking at the research that many of your colleagues pointed us to, it was very evident that there was a real need in K-12 education. That a lot of teachers tend to use technology, the, the pedagogy, in however they were taught in their undergraduate programs or however they were taught in K-12 education themselves. And that those behaviors are very difficult to change once they, they leave that educational system. So why not move it back a few spaces? And at the same time, there seems to be more and more emphasis uh, from many of the stakeholders of education on where is technology being, being utilized. So there was definitely you know, a, a route for Microsoft to leverage many of the assets that we already have in our partners in learning for paper 12, but also here seemed to be a real need here. So, why is TPAC the foundation? So we have looked at, and there's lots and lots of technology workshops out there. Uh, many of them are very, very good, and, and, but most of them tend to focus on the tools. They tend to focus on this LMS system, or perhaps Word, or Excel, et cetera. And there is a need for that, but there also needs to be something much more holistic. How can this really be tied, especially at the collegiate level? People want frameworks. They want a way to really understand, how does this fit in with my daily work? Now, the other thing is, is that we could have a workshop that lasts a day, a week, a month, and still not cover the plethora of all the possible technology that is out there for all the different situations and all the different do uh, domain, content domain. But we felt that if we could have a framework that people could then utilize once they see that framework in action and they see how technologies are being applied to math, to science, to social studies, to English language arts, 
then they could make the leap in the future on when they have a new problem of practice, oh, I remember what Joe said in math, and this is perhaps how I might be able to play, apply this. And so TPAC provides that for us. We searched and looked at a lot of different types of frameworks, but it became clearer and clearer as time went on that TPAC was the way to go. And looking at the, uh, um, the EdIT library uh, via site and AACPE, the plethora of articles, and especially also at the site conference, uh, all the different sections that are associated with TPAC, uh, we felt we, we picked the right one. So there's a, a deep integration with, with TPAC here. So, uh, it would have been very easy for Microsoft to develop its own program, its own workshop. Uh, we could have probably turned something out in a couple months, and it would have been okay. Nice, glossy marketing uh, brochures and whatnot. Uh, but it probably would not have been all that valuable to the educational community. So instead, we took a very different route. We invited a number of educators, the module builders that are in the room, some of the other TI board members, to really help us design this program. And so really, it is an educator design program for other educators. Now, that's taken a lot longer, and especially my management team uh, would have liked. Uh, but we know how things are uh, in, in higher education, the various committees you have to have and the various dial, yeah, right? You know how, you've been in those meetings, especially with tenured faculty, okay? You know how that is. But we really think that it's produced a much, much better product, if you will, as far as helping you. So again, it was developed for educators by educators. And I guess the, the last thing is, is that a lot of the uh, technology workshops that I've been to and I have seen, they're very techno, Centric. It's about the product. It's you know learning Excel or it's learning you know the LMS system, etc. And and just as a caveat, we're going to show you lots of book products or lots of technology. And surprise, surprise, quite a bit of it, not all of it, will be Microsoft. <laughs> exactly. When I was in your position, I was I used to be an associate dean of the Graduate School of Management at Wake Forest University and a faculty member in the Graduate School there. And so I had, early on in my career, an interest in technology. And so when I went to programs like this, it was okay to talk about the concepts, but I wanted to see it in action. And if I decided to use some other technology or technology differently, that was up to me. But I really wanted to go all the way down. And that's, that's why you're going to see some very deep examples, some very uh, exemplars of how these faculty module builders have aligned TPAC with the technology set. But again, it's not techno-centric focus. It's really problems of practice, TPAC focus, and then how the technology is an, an enabler. So, uh, and, and also the research shows that those kind of workshops don't make a lot of difference and impact the, the teachers very much. And of course, all of these slides uh, you'll be able to have uh, at, the, at the end of the program. Okay, so with that, I'm gonna turn, turn over to my colleague, Mark, and he's gonna provide an overview of TPAC. I'll switch this over to this. My name is Mark Hofer. I'm a faculty member in the School of Education at the College of William and Mary, about two and a half, three hours southeast of here in DC. And uh, there at William and Mary, I teach the educational technology course for pre-service teachers in our undergrad, master's, and fifth year programs. And I also teach uh, doctoral level courses in our curriculum and ed tech doctoral program. Uh, and in my capacity here, I'm also one of the co-chairs uh, of the TPAC SIG at the site conference. So I'm here to introduce TPAC for you today. But I'd like to start with just a show of hands. Before you received information about the TDI project and, and decided to come out, uh, how many people have, had, were familiar with TPAC already? That's easily more than half. That's fascinating. That's fascinating. You know, my, my colleague at William & Mary, Judy Harris, calls TPAC the closest thing to a viral idea that she's seen in, in educational technology in 20 years. It really is remarkable. Uh, Jim alluded to the fact that at the site conference, there it's the second largest SIG and the second most sessions related to TPAC of any other topic at the conference. So there's so much energy, so much enthusiasm, and so much international interest around TPAC that really it's, it's phenomenal. So given the fact that a lot of you are already familiar with this, I won't spend a lot of time on sort of introducing the construct but what we are going to do is try to set up the rest of the day for you in terms of thinking about how is TPAC developed and practically applied in our teaching. So we're going to try to make that bridge between theory and practice that we'll come back to um, in just a little bit. So first of all, what is TPAC? It's built on Schulman's work. 
uh, Putin Mishra and Matt Kaler from Michigan State in 2006 had a publication in Teachers College Record where they built on Schulman's framework of pedagogical content knowledge. Back in the mid 80s when Schulman introduced that construct, technology tools and resources were fairly limited. So now, of course, with all the plethora of tools and resources available to teachers very commonly, that's a whole new domain of knowledge that teachers need to be able to draw on when they're thinking about integrating technology in their teaching. So when you bring technology, that domain of knowledge, together with a teacher's understanding of content and pedagogy, we create some new overlaps, some new synergies. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll talk about sort of how that, how that comes to fruition and some grounded examples to sort of illustrate that in context. But I think one of the misconceptions is that TPAC is technology integration. And TPAC is the, le the result of the lesson that you see in the classroom. But really, it's a framework that describes teacher knowledge and the ways in which they can draw on those three domains and find a synergistic combination between the three where they fit. That's when you see, when you go into a classroom and you see a teacher using technology effectively, what you're seeing is that fit between the content of the lesson, the pedagogical strategies employed, and the technology used. So as Jim said, uh, very different than the more typical uh, technocentric approach. We have a couple decades at least a big push to, to introduce more and, and more rich and more varied concept technologies in K-12 and in higher ed, and consequently a lot of ed tech professional development. Unfortunately, a lot of that professional development has been structured around the tools themselves and the affordances or the new opportunities or potentials that they can provide in classroom instruction. And the assumption, the erroneous assumption was, well, if we can make the case for introducing these new tools to teachers and say, look at all the things you can do with them, look at the powerful opportunities that they provide, then they'll naturally go back to their classrooms, their teaching context, and figure out how to fit that in with their coursework. Turns out, it's a little more complicated than that. When you get focused on the tools and you start, you just get fixated on the features, and we probably, I, you wouldn't be here if you weren't uh, somewhat of a technology enthusiast. It's easy to get fixated on all these great potential and just think about how can I fit this in? What are all the ways I can use this tool? Second Life, uh, you know, um, OneNote, you know, whatever the tool might be. How can I fit, find ways to fit this into my curriculum? But Papert from MIT talks about that kind of thinking as technocentric. When you get fixated on the, the affordances of the tools, you lose sight of what's really more important, and that's the content and the pedagogy. So TPAC is a way to, to, to I guess, kind of, I think of it as an ed tech person, to hold ourselves accountable to the fact that really we need to situate the tools in the larger context of what's more important. So that's why we thought TPAC was a good framework. And we saw the image just a few moments ago of the, uh, the faculty member at, at Microsoft headquarters in Redmond. You know, you can imagine 20-some advisory board members. This was one of the few things that early on we agreed that TPAC might be a good framework to organize our thinking. So that's what you'll see sort of played out in, in, in the sessions today. I thought that might be helpful to, to ground it in a few different examples to say, how does this framework get translated into teaching practice? So the first is going to be more of a content-specific example in science. So my apologies to the science folks out there. I was a former high school history teacher. So if I muck this up, please give me a little latitude, all right? <laughs> so imagine a high school, his, uh, high school science teacher. Uh, and they're, they're talking about the impact of human activity on the environment. And in particular, we're here here in, uh, in Virginia and, and Maryland, we're Chesapeake Bay and the, the large watershed here. So they want to take a look at what's the human impact on water quality in the Chesapeake Bay. So when we think about bringing together the content and the technology, so we draw on our knowledge of, of this, is what, this is the content I need to cover. This is, these are the, maybe the misconceptions that I know that students might have and some of the, the key understandings and concepts I want students to, to come away with. And then we, take a, we think about, well, what are some technology tools that might assist us in representing that content in a way that's going to be helpful for my students? So when we do that, when we bring together the content and the technology, then what we're doing is we're drawing on our TCK, or technological content knowledge. So 
in some ways, in some disciplines, technology literally changes the content, particularly in science. As we, the technologies advance, we develop new understandings related to the discipline. So that's where we can see TCK sort of in action. More commonly, though, it's when a teacher selects a technology tool or resource relevant, connected with the content that they're teaching. So far, so good? Good combination here would be a data analysis or visualization tool, spreadsheet like Excel. That allows students to look at a number of different variables, pH, uh, 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 turbidity, um, uh, oxygen content in the water, and try to see if there are relationships between any of those variables. So it allows students to explore that content in a more powerful way. So we'll just get a quick little demo here. So what you're seeing here, and this is just a little what we call community clip, a video clip of uh, someone working on the inside of Excel. but. You know, basically students being able to use these quick analysis tools and be show different visualizations of the same data um, and therefore hopefully getting a better understanding of what the underlying functions are here. Is, you know, is uh, the pH causing the particular issue that we're seeing, et cetera. But uh, again, a different a way to visualize if, uh, if a student is more visually oriented versus quantitatively oriented, et cetera, those tools allowing that. And that quick, the, the idea of a quick analysis tool for them to quickly to explore how these variables might be related in different ways is a powerful affordance for the students to understand how these variables would interact. So it presents a different way to look at that content than they might get through a lecture or through a textbook reading or things like that. The technology provides some value to teaching the content itself. So another way to look at it is another intersection here is between the technology and the pedagogy, or technological pedagogical knowledge. So again, they're bringing together their understanding of what are the different ways that are powerful pedagogies in science? What are the tools that are available and how might they connect? So in science, learning cycle, inquiry cycle, very important. Problem-based learning, very important. The idea is to position the students doing the work of scientists. Powerful pedagogies. So technologies like Excel, data visualization is a great connection with that exploratory nature. Another thing is the use of handheld devices for kids to go out and collect their own data. With digital probes connected to a mobile device, uh, even using a very inexpensive uh, magnifying lens on a smartphone camera to be able to go collect data, pull that up in the cloud, go back to the classroom, and to look at it. So they can ask their own questions. They can think about what are the, what are the, the best ways to, to capture and collect this data? How can we look at it? It really, it's not all that different than the way scientists work out in the field. And the mobile devices allow them to get out there and collect their own data. It's great to work from existing data sets, but in some ways it's even more powerful when they can create and generate those data sets themselves. So, those are the sort of subsets. Technology and pedagogy, technology and content. Really what's most important though is when we see all three come together. So hopefully you can see from that science-based example that the, if the focus is on water quality in Chesapeake Bay, you've got these powerful tools that support the kind of pedagogy that we're trying to encourage in our pre-service teachers to take out to the classroom themselves. So it's a really synergistic effect. And when we see the intersection between all three of those areas, then that's where we see really effective use of the technology. Those are examples of technologies that allow you to do things more efficiently, more effectively, to augment what you could do without it. That's really what we're looking for. It's not just looking for what can we plug in here in the curriculum, but what's really gonna add value and enhance the learning experience. That's when we have to, and if you just take a step back and think about that, that's why, you know, we've seen, despite all this money poured into schools and universities with technology, and all this professional development, why we haven't perhaps seen greater payoff in terms of classroom instruction with technology is because it's complex. Those skills of bringing together those domains of knowledge are things that need to be consciously developed. And having this framework, again, it it's sort of keeps me honest as an tech person to really think about, is this really a good connection with the content? Is this really a good connection with the pedagogy? That, in that way, we can hopefully identify more effective, appropriate uses of technology. 
So that's a, that's a very discipline-specific example. Those are tools, you know, the, the data collection of probes pretty specific to science. Uh, spreadsheet software, probably science and math, maybe a little bit in social studies, but still fairly discipline-specific tool. And that's what you're going to see today in the session. You're going to see some really great grounded examples of technologies that work particularly well in different disciplines. Let's take a step back, though. Some of the schools that are, some of the technologies and resources that, that you have in your classrooms and your students have in their classrooms out in their placement schools tend to be more universal tools, like the, the software embedded in Office, like Skype for communication. Those technologies, even though they're not necessarily content specific, can still be used in ways that connect with powerful representations of the content, pedagogy is unique to the discipline. So I thought it might be also helpful to take a step back and look at some more common, typical tools and see how TPAC plays out in those examples. So just a few quick ideas. So one is using video conferencing technology for communication. It's always great when we can expand the walls of the classroom. So I've got a quick little video clip from uh, one of my colleagues at William & Mary, Dr. Tracy Cross, who's the director for the Center of Gifted Education there. Tracy would be the first person to tell you that he's not a power user of technology. He has a very, um, technology is a tool and it's only useful when it directly will enhance the learning experience for his students. Skype was something that he used personally to keep in touch with folks you know, from around the country. And he thought, Skype might be a way for me to bring in experts from around the country into my classroom to help my students understand the theories that we talk about in a doctoral level seminar in gifted education in a more deep way. And also to support a, a kind of pedagogy around discussion, around pushing, asking questions, you know, looking for additional examples, trying to, you know, as academics we do, try to poke holes in things. He thought, what a great opportunity to bring people into the classroom. So I'll let Tracy uh, explain really quickly. This is just a quick screencast that, uh, that we captured using Skype. He, he's connected with theorists, the same theories that his students are studying in this doctoral seminar, and he wanted to provide the opportunity for his students to interact directly with these folks, to be able to ask questions about the theories. First of all, they could present the theories themselves, because a lot of them are, are very sophisticated and nuanced. He felt like they could do a better job than he could to present that theory to the class. But it also offered the students the opportunity to have a discussion, to talk back and forth, to ask questions, to, again, sort of prod for examples and, and sort of test these theories out. And it had the side benefit of connecting students at William & Mary with leaders all over the country, all over the world, so that they had an opportunity to build relationships with these scholars in all these different disciplines. So it helped them to have a better, deeper understanding of the content, the theories that they're studying, and connect with all these people from all over the country. It just wouldn't have been feasible for him to bring all these people on campus. So that's Skype. Very common tool, anything from a desktop computer laptop to a smartphone. A little bit more powerful tool, Link, affords all the same potential as Skype, but also a lot of additional collaborative features. You can do multi-site connections, and the software is smart enough to whoever's speaking to pull that person's video connection to the forefront. You can collaborate, can share slides, can share documents, collaborative whiteboards, a lot of additional collaboration tools. So it's not just one or even back and forth communication, but other opportunities to connect and to support the learning experience. So that's one example of just a, a very sort of universal kind of tool. Another one, another sort of problem of practice that I bet we all experience. Collaboration is so important in education today at all levels, whether you're at the university in K-12, and more and more, I'll speak for myself, I do more collaborative research than I do individual research. We challenge students in our courses to do collaborative research. It's an important aspect of professional dispositions and, and skills to develop. But it can be challenging when, you know, it used to be your research, your raw material turned out to be the three by five note cards where you, where you copy down passages with little bibliographic uh, <laughs> references to different sources. We've all been there, right? Well, now the raw material, with still those handwritten notes, but also PDF files, other documents, uh, data sets, video clips, audio clips, handwritten notes, all those different things. So now, all of a sudden, sharing that raw material within a team 
to make sense of that, to synthesize the material, is a challenge. So a tool that can help you do that is OneNote. You can incorporate all those different kinds of, of raw material of your research together into one searchable, filter, filterable uh, tool that helps students really work with that data and start to make sense of it together. If it's hosted on SkyDrive in the cloud, they can contribute to it from wherever they are, asynchronously or synchronously. One of the really interesting things is even with handwritten notes, the software is smart enough to be able to search. It does the OCR recognition of handwriting, unless you have really bad scrawl. Uh, it can actually search within the context of their handwritten notes. That's a pretty powerful kind of affordance, I think, of that particular tool. Uh, they're even working on ways to be able to search within audio and video clips the, the, uh, the content to be able to search those as well. So great way to not only pool data and resources for research projects, but to help them to synthesize that material as well. Again, content, pedagogy, technology, connection. Then finally, the last little clip. This is something more near and dear to my heart, I guess. One of the challenges that, that I deal with, particularly in upper level courses, but this is true really in any of our courses, I'm sure, is bridging that theory to practice. It's one thing to understand theoretical models and frameworks, but it's another thing entirely to be able to apply that to the messy, complicated reality of a K-12 classroom. But that's what we challenge our students to do, to appropriate the ideas that we demonstrate and then put it into practice. That could be a significant leap in some cases. Uh, TPA, in the doctoral level seminar on on curriculum-based technology integration that I taught last summer, TPAC, unsurpri not surprisingly, was an important framework that I used in the class. And the students in prior semesters had been able to certainly understand the theory, write papers related to it, develop unit plans, incorporating technology into that. But what they had difficulty seeing is when they would go, because it's about teacher knowledge, they had more of a difficult time going into a classroom and doing an observation and being able to find evidence of TPAC. Things move fast, there's a lot going on in the classroom. It was just challenging for them to see TPAC in action. So one of the projects that I did this summer with the students is I, in small groups, I had them each go uh, video record a lesson in a classroom where the teacher was integrating technology in some way. They pooled those videos and found one that they thought was an interesting, potentially powerful use of technology or a lesson where there were some challenges that were evident to unpack, to try to see evidence of TPAC in that particular lesson. So what students did was they, they captured the video, they sort of communicated outside of class, and they watched the video and tried to individually try to find evidence of those different intersections, technology and content, technology and pedagogy, and so forth. They came to that with some ideas to the to three-hour class session over the summer. So what I had them do is get together in groups then and start clipping that video, pulling out those slices of the lesson that they thought illustrated some of these different aspects. And they could talk together, push back on each other a little bit, and say, is this really a good example of TPK? Because maybe they could have used this tool instead, or you could see where the students were struggling in this aspect. So all of a sudden, they're having some really good conversations around this theory in practice. And so what they did was, um, and this isn't so important to, to hear the, the the uh, audio. So what they did was, in that three-hour session, they used Movie Maker to cobble together a, about, a, in this case, about a 10-minute video case of that classroom practice. Got some jazzy music that you can't hear too bad. Be able to check out this out later. And a very dramatic uh, overlay of uh, reflection. So basically, we can, they, they have the opportunity to to unpack that lesson as they as it unfolds, there's again those, those key moments where they can see good evidence or to highlight areas where had the teacher done this, it might have been a little bit more powerful, a little bit more effective. So just in that three hours, they had that opportunity to really bridge that theory of practice in a way that was very real to them and really advanced their thinking as far as the framework was concerned. With Windows Live, uh, now Movie Maker can be done online as well. Because one of the challenges, I, I do a lot of work with student creative videos, and one of the challenges when you're tied to a particular machine, you upload your files and you, you're tied to that particular machine, now they can do this actually through a web browser. They can do it asynchronously or synchronously. I can get that three hours of last time back. And they can still work collaboratively to do the work. So it was a really powerful way for students to bridge that theory in practice. So 
hopefully, you know, these are, you're going to see other examples. You're going to have a lot of opportunity today, and I look forward to joining in those conversations about what are some powerful ways that technology connects with your discipline with the way that you want to encourage your pre-service teachers to teach and to change that sort of their experience and their practice. So hopefully this sets the stage a little bit, gives you some ideas of sort of that practical connection. And I mean, I just, just literally have that thought in mind. How are these three pieces really fitting together in this lesson? And interestingly, you can always ask, if we were to change this tool, how might that change the learning experience? If we were to, to use a little bit different pedagogy, how would that change the learning experience? So hopefully this framework isn't just something that is a construct that's useful for researchers, but that it really is something that can practically inform professional development, maybe even more importantly, your own teaching and the teaching of your pre-service teachers. So I look forward to, to talking with you today as you go through the sessions. Any questions for Mark as we continue? I just talked to you.